Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about the subject of compliance, which I know sounds incredibly boring, but actually I started getting into um, compliance more than 20 years ago, largely through not doing it and finding as I needed to. And I found out that actually it's considerably more interesting than you might expect. Uh, to give you some cost context, I think I payments within an individual country is kind of blissfully unaware of the need for compliance. We, we think it's something that happens to other people. So um, we think if you're in the financial sector, it's all about banks. What do they do with their deposits? Uh, how well do they know their customers? How do they manage the risk? And, and how, do they, how do they manage gearing, for example? I mean, speaking about that, I think we could have a, have a whole session on gearing. Because that somebody once said to me that um, if if gearing is first explained to you and you're not shocked, then you haven't understood what you're being told. So it is a fascinating subject in itself. So in the payment sector in general, compliance often gets overlooked until the regulatory authorities come knocking. Um, and regulatory compliance for cross-border transactions takes us out of this cosy worldview, and that's certainly how I got into this. Um, cross-border without compliance is very easy, but illegal, and that's what we started off with. Way back when, I was uh, involved in developing the original architecture for M-Pesa in Kenya, and once it once it uh, went live, I, I kind of got um, moved on from defining MPESA and defining the operations, blah, 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 all of that stuff. And I thought to myself, well, we could easily adapt this model for cross-border transactions. And unfortunately, cross-border transactions are very cheap and very easy if you don't bother with compliance. Compliance is where a lot of the complexity lies, and where complexity lies is cost, I'm afraid. Um, uh, how does compliance relate to Mojaloop? Well, Mojaloop isn't even a payment system. It's a switch which connects payment systems. So a domestic mojo loop deployment is not directly related, uh, regulated in most jurisdictions. It's not true everywhere. We've been hearing for at least a couple of years rumblings that some jurisdictions, uh, can't spell jurisdictions, um, are considering it. And in fact, now we know India is definitely doing it. Uh, they've announced that it is um, gonna happen. We suspect that Kenya is moving in this direction and possibly some announcements might come relatively soon. But uh, re to reassure you, we don't necessarily need to worry too much about domestic uh, compliance. If we implement compliance for international transactions um, and, and just apply it to the domestic world. So uh, uh, if we do it for international, then the lighter uh, compliance that you need for domestic tri transactions actually comes for free. I'd emphasize that, well, in my view at least, it's vital not to extend the module core functionality beyond that of being a switch. Um, if you start doing additional things like, well, merchant payments within the switch, uh, foreign exchange within the switch, wallets integrated with the switch, these are all regulated activities and suddenly you find your unregulated mojo loop deployment becomes directly regulated everywhere and to a far more complex degree. So I would argue strongly as, uh, in favor of keeping at mojo loop the switch as a switch and anything else being layered on at the outside for people who want to do that to take on that regulatory burden themselves. Driving, horse, driving force behind international regulation and therefore uh, compliance is FATF. I've spoken to this before. I'm saying it again because I really don't think that most people in the payment community quite understand the importance of FATF. It's an international governmental organization. Um, it was established in 1989. It was originally um, built to uh, um, combat of money laundering and terrorist financing, and also to uh, think about other threats to integrity. FATF publishes 40 recommendations on the financial conduct of financial businesses. Um, I would uh, urge everybody 
to actually read the FATA 40 recommendations if you're involved in payments at all. It's far more readable than you might expect. It's uh, and it's very interesting. Um, it talks about the uh, regulation uh, of financial businesses, payment transactions, um, and it's been extended over the years and to go beyond money laundering and terrorist financing to proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, although they're politely called recommendations, they're not recommendations. But of recommend that national regulators uh, enact them in domestic regulation. If you don't, your country is likely to be grey or blacklisted, meaning that the rest of the world cannot or will not conduct transactions with that country. So there is nothing even remotely optional about compliance with these recommendations. And this is a, a picture I found about a fat for a FATF meeting. Um, I, I've actually attended one of these meetings. I got to sit in the back in that back row. You might see them there. They're all sitting there paying close attention. You're not allowed to say a word if you're in that back row. You're only allowed in on condition of total silence. You're not allowed to talk to anyone else or certainly not to the important people in the front desks. But it was interesting to be there as an observer anyway. But it's uh, an extraordinary organization. So I'm not going to go through all the FATF recommendations. Most of them don't apply to us in any way. But there are some key ones. Um, there's FATF recommendation 16, which is all about wire transfers, which essentially means international transactions. Um, there's uh, an element of recommendation 16, which has come to be known as the travel rule, which took which specifies these basic restrictions. So cross-border transactions over $1,000 must carry with them the name of the originator, the originator's account number, some way of identifying the originator, so the address, national identity number, customer identification number, date and place of birth, some way of making sure that you can, you can demonstrate that the originator's bank has done the KYC. Uh, the name of the beneficiary, the beneficiary account number, um, but you can actually carry a, a unique transaction reference number instead of an account number if you want. Just below $1,000, um, number three, all of the KYC data is not actually required, but there are still some countries that, is, that insist on it, even so. So it very much depends on the individual jurisdiction. Intermediaries. Um, what we politely refer to as FXPs, foreign exchange providers, well, they're a subclass of intermediary. But um, from our perspective, that's all we need to really think about. So if you're an intermediary, if you're an FXP, you must ensure that all of the information provided by the payer FSP and returned by the payee FSP is propagated through with the transaction. You mustn't lose any of that, any of that travel data. Um, intermediary financial institution has to take reasonable measures to identify cross-border wire, cross wire transfers that lack this information. And you as the FXP should have effective risk-based policies and procedures for determining whether you should actually ca uh, carry on with that transaction if there isn't sufficient information in there. And that kind of applies to us as well. We need to think, well, if if this um, if this payer FSP is sending us this transaction and it's missing the KYC data and it's over $1,000, maybe we should drop it, refuse to take the transaction. Um, flexibility. Uh, we cannot assume that the travel rule data list is complete. We know this has been extended in the past. And we know that there's currently pressure from some FATF members to extend the data. Um, and in fact, somebody told me that it was expected to be uh, addressed during the um, plenary. There's just been a plenary meeting of FATF. Um, but the request to extend the travel rule data didn't get consensus this time. At least I haven't found it in any of the reports of the plenary. So, but it may well happen next time. So the corollary of this is, if we're coding for the travel rule data, don't code for just the fields that are already listed. 
assume the list will grow over time. Part of recommendation 11 is another important one. We have to keep records of all transactions for five years. And it's not just for our own data, our, our own purposes. It has to actually be useful to the supervisory authorities in the relevant jurisdictions. In other words, they have to be able to come and look at the transactions and the travel rule data for a period of five years. So we have to be really careful about uh, disposing of transaction data. Reporting of suspicious transactions is one of my favorites. If a, if a financial institution suspects or has reasonable grounds to suspect that funds are the proceeds of criminal activity or are related to terrorist fire, financing or acquiring WMDs, it should be required by law to report promptly its suspicions to the Financial Intelligence Unit. Why does that matter? We're not looking at the individual um, uh, um, sources of sources of value, sources of funds in an individual transaction. Uh, yeah, but actually, this is kind of being extended to mean you have to monitor for signs of money laundering. We've all heard of AML, so it, we, at the, being in the switch, are in the prime position to spot AML where that AML is happening across multiple DFSBs. So there is a there is a growing assumption that we but by being the man in the middle here, should be the ones who are actually um, uh, propagating those, uh, identifying those transactions or identifying those money laundering attempts. Financial Intelligence Unit and FIU, it's a mandated institution in every compliant country. Recommendation 29. Like I say, I recommend that everybody reads the 40 recommendations. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Data protection and privacy. Uh, financial authorities are not the only regulators out there. They may come as a shock. Um, consider the data which is being held by Mojaloop. Uh, we're looking at five years worth of, of, um, of transaction data. Can a transaction identify an end user and their financial activity? And you are going to store it for five years, which is recommendation 11, by the way. Have you even heard of privacy? Who can access the data? Have you carried out a cybersecurity review? How recently? Which cybersecurity frameworks did you use? Did you do more than one framework? And should did you do both top down and bottom up? What control points have you implemented, which do not come with the Mojo Loop Hub, by the way? That's all about controlling that, uh, controlling and monitoring the activities of people who are the real cybersecurity risk. Um, and have you documented what step you took, steps you took to close gaps? The Mojo Loop architects are aware of these requirements, and developers, and particularly, I'd argue, deployers need to be aware of this, and they need to do their own their own work on this. So, like like the meme says, I don't always think about cybersecurity, but when I do, it's usually too late. Um, so. The constraints on a Mojo Loop deployment. We're not a DFSP, so what do we need to do? Well, I actually think this is really important from a DFSP's perspective. If I'm a large bank and I'm looking at the um, fines that have been handed out due to non-compliance with laws derived from the FATF recommendations, you know, there are, there are banks out there which have had to pay fines in the five, seven billion dollar range for non-compliance with this stuff. Then if they're going to join a Mojulu boost based scheme, they need to be absolutely, completely sure that they will be able to meet their regulatory obligations with regard to transactions which go through the Mojulu switch. If we're not able to um, transmit accurately all of the travel data passed by the originator end to end, including via an intermediary, and also to other schemes, and handle it back in the other direction as well, they won't join the scheme. They'll, they'll look elsewhere because the risk to them is too much. The risk of non-compliance is potentially existential for a large bank. We have to also support transaction rejection. 
by the beneficiary organization due to insufficiencies in the travel data. Um, we need to consider whether this needs a separate error code as well. And we also need perhaps the FXP. The FXP, when they are developing, we need to specify you need to be carrying out these checks as well and potentially rejecting transactions on this basis. We've got to store all the transaction related data and that's for five years. But, uh, and I, I did check this with the lawyer, it doesn't all have to be online. We can archive it regularly, um, provided it's searchable. Ideally, it should be air gapped so it's not accessible over the internet. You you kick it off the, your um, your Mojo Loop Hub and into some form of archiving structure, which still renders it use, usable and searchable for when the when the uh, FIU comes comes calling. Also, for our uh, our purposes, we only actually need the basic data in clear. Um, you know, pointing back to privacy and data protection. We actually only need to know the name of the beneficiary and the beneficiary account number, and they're already addressed as part of the party personal info field in the in FSPIOP. And there are fields there where we can store the rest of the travel data in the, in the KYC information field, for example. But it's not just KYC information, as we've seen. There's other, other stuff we have to carry as well. Um, I wonder, I speculate, whether the rest of the travel data could be transmitted and stored as an encrypted blob in that in, in that information field so that we don't have to see it and we don't expose ourselves to um, action around privacy and data protection. Um, and by just using a blob, that would also facilitate probable changes in the travel data. We know it's uh, we know it's not static. We know it's growing. Um, over time. If we were to do any sort of encryption, then I would say we really don't want to be involved in setting up that encryption. We don't want to know anything about it. We want to bury our heads in the sand and let other people deal with it. So the encryption would have to be coordinated out of band. Um, the two DFSPs involved would have to um, uh, uh, coordinate how they do the encryption, whatever it is, I don't want to know. We just get the encrypted blob and store it. And then at the, if, if the FIU wants access, bring a key with you, which you will presumably have got from one of the two DFSPs involved in the transaction. Um, I'm trying to here to balance the fact that we need to store all this data that we've been given. We need to transmit it end to end, but we really don't want to know about it. And um, it, it just adds risk and complexity for us. Uh, one more thing. Regulatory, regulatory momentum is trending towards switches being required to monitor transactions, including attempting to identifying money laundering, terrorist foreign financing, WMD, etc. We can anticipate that some jurisdictions will require that module that will monitor, not stop. We're not going into that um, uh, for reasons related to the efficiency of the switch, but at least monitor and identify transactions which could constitute um, an AML offense. And we may need to generate notifications, uh, subs um, suspicious, traction suspicious transaction reports we might need to send these directly to the FIU or to the affected DFSPs or participant DFSPs, according to local regulation. I noticed that our friend Teddy from CBC this morning was talking about this, and I think we're very alive to this issue. We don't necessarily have the perfect solution for this right now, but we do have options. FRMS is a natural candidate, but we're a we're aware the focus of FRMS is on fraud, not AML. Uh, for example, we need a focus on AML identification across multiple non-sequential transactions. Uh, smurfing attacks just as a very simple, the very simple basic type of AML. And we need to um, evaluate FRMS in this context. So that's something that we 
need to be doing over the next over the, over the coming months i think and we need to have a um, a credible solution to this as you've seen uh, i think the the uh, the risks associated with non compliance are are far too big to the to the development of a, a viable commercial led um, mode of deployment and i think that's all i want to say for now so Thank you very much and uh, open it to questions if if there are any. Um, I think I can take one or two questions. Uh, right, here we go. Uh, Paul, there's, an, uh, there's a question here from the Bank of South Sudan. Thank you um, for the presentation. My question is uh, on the experience that you might have in a situation where by the economy has not yet uh, regulated almost everything. And you have other actors that are not necessarily using switches or banks. You have many of them transferring money in big amounts outside and inside the, the, the economy or in the country. And uh, it has been very difficult to report definitely to FIU. And so what, what, what is the experience that uh, you might have in handling or in uh, uh, helping us on this kind of thing? Thank you. Um, I, believe, I believe you're from South Sudan, is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct, Paul. Yeah, I don't have experience in South Sudan, but I was working in Sudan uh, a few years ago now, and there was a significant problem uh, with um, unregulated money transfers uh, using uh, airtime through mobile networks with um, airtime purchase and airtime redemption being free, essentially. So it was acting as an unregulated uh, money laundering scheme, essentially. And it was uh, it was extremely hard to do anything about it without the backing of the central bank. And at the time, the central bank felt that um, they didn't want to do anything about it for, for reasons that um, I'm sure we can all understand. And therefore, the legitimate um, regulated institutions, in that case, mobile wallets, were um, really struggling to have profitable businesses because they were being undermined by this unofficial channel for, for money transfer. Until you have a strong regulator, a regulator that is able, has the, has the um, legislative backing to issue fines and, and other punishments to stop this activity, then there's very little you can do. You need, you need the backing of um, the central bank. You need the, the backing of the government itself. Um, and uh, until that's in place, then all else is moot. But um, there is a very strong argument for making sure that the, the regulations and the legislation is put in place and the supervision and enforcement, because only, only then are you actually open to international transactions and um, the benefits that that brings in terms of economic growth. So um, I know that's a very um, high level response to, to your question, but uh, it's difficult to dive down into any more detail in, in this in this environment. Thanks, Paul. Um, would you like, you want to make a comment on the same? Oh, sure, go ahead. Hi, Paul, it's Michael. Um, I wanted to say- Hi, Michael. One of the things you said was that Mojaloop contains the account number. I don't think that's true. Mojaloop contains an identifier, which in some accidental cases may be the same as an account. My connection has frozen. Hmm? Sorry? Oh. Okay. Can you hear me? I can now, yes. Okay, cool. Sorry. So I wanted to say that my understanding is that Mojaloop does not store account numbers. 
it stores identifiers, which may be coincidentally the same as account numbers, for instance, in mobile yep. systems, but we definitely don't store account numbers. And there is no field, for instance, in the party personal info structure, which has an account number. Now, my recollection is mm -hmm. FATF makes an exception for transactions which are not identified by account number uh, and which do not therefore need to have the same set of information associated with them. And I kind of think that uh, Mojo Loop transactions may be like that, though it, well, I would be interested. I asked someone from FATF, uh, they didn't respond. But uh, I think it's a uh, something we certainly need to consider. And if we do need to include the account number, then we will have to make some substantial changes to the way in which Mojo works. I, I don't think we do need to necessarily include the account number. We have to include um, a unique transaction number, which can be uh, used to derive the account number at the source FSP. Yeah. And I, multiple steps for Potentially, we definitely do that because we have a unique transaction ID. So I, I yeah. think that we are covered without needing to include travel information. I've lost you again. Sorry. I hope this. Um, Can you hear me now? Was better during my presentation. Hello. No. Can you hear me? No. I can, yes, intermittently. Intermittently, yeah, sorry. So uh, and I think the consequence of that is that we don't need to include the uh, personal information in the travel, uh, in the, sorry, in the travel document. The, the, the flaw in that is that the uh, unique transaction number uh, can be used to derive all of that personal data. And so therefore we are by proxy carrying that data. Uh, 